So welcome everyone to Revitalizing Syllabi, the Sierra Season Tech Tools for Integrated Learning. Um, so I thought we would just start a little bit with um, one question, if you would. Go to the next slide as we're thinking about this. Um, one reason that I chose to attend this session is, so go ahead and fill that Mentimeter item in there. And it's great to see you. And we, this is very important to us because uh, if we know your intentions, then we're more likely to address them or kind of pivot to think about how we can. You have the QR code, but there's also a link in the chat for the Mentimeter as well, whichever is easier. Yep. And I just re-put it in the chat if you joined after we put it in. Thanks, Caroline. Okay, so because the link is also in the chat, we'll do a tiny bit of multitasking here and we'll just um, introduce our the presenters a little bit. So we have uh, Dr. Donna Marie Colmalat. She uh, is at a conference kind of right now. So she's doing a little bit of multitasking. So you won't hear as much from her perhaps, but uh, she will jump in. So um, if you have any specific questions for her, you might want to also put them in the chat as well as say them verbally. And that way we can always take them if needed. Um, we and she is in the College of um, of Education here at East Strasburg University in the Department of Professional and Secondary Education Instructional Design Technologies, and also one of the co-directors of PEDC, which you'll hear us mention a lot today, which is probably how you heard about this as well. And we have uh, Dr. Kellen Depipihoy, who is um, in special education and rehabilitative services here at ESU, and then myself in professional and secondary education. And so we come from a little bit of a different background because my background is also technology. And so we think about things in those ways. So hopefully um, today we'll have people that can answer some questions or shed light on different parts of the integration of the CRSEs in your syllabi. Okay. Thanks, Deborah, for that note. The important work you're interested in is perspectives being real and authentic in relation to the competencies. That is oh, so important, right? Um, mm -hmm. That transparency, because students feel it, they they know when it's not. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, they do. Um, it's, it's the beauty of, of what we do, why we do it. So um, in, in what we present today, we're going to look at that intersection of the culturally relevant and sustaining um, education competencies, also with technology, because technology is that implementation of something. And I like what you said here, Deborah, and I'm going to lean on it back and forth. So I apologize um, if I call you yeah. out, but that authentic aspect, because <clears throat> if we just have it in writing, but don't have it in, in our actions, Correct. then then we're being hypocritical between our message and, and our actions. So that implementation, that embodiment of our values and beliefs is, is important to um, that actualizing of the vision and also then empowering our students, right? So that is that interact section of all those different portions. Thank you. Absolutely. Excellent. So the need for this work. Um, if you're here, you probably have a good understanding of this. Um, but we want to ground ourselves in the importance as well. So the lack of retention is important that we we think of, especially of our BIPOC population at our um, institutions of higher education in Pennsylvania. We have 37% students of color um, that are not adequately served in our K-12 schools. And we know that because they're not jumping into teacher education. <laughs> um, but, you know, so they face um, teacher preparation is really challenging. Um, we have an opportunity gap that exists between um, our students of color and white students in Pennsylvania. And we want to address that so that all of our students become smarter um, and more able to activate in our global society. And we have the desire of, you know, all of us institutions of higher education, we have a desire in our hearts to meet our students' needs. So this is one way that can help us do that. And also we need to respond to PDE's requirement for these these competencies, the CRSCs, in order to help us. And it's helping us as well as compliance. So let's move on to our goals. So what do we hope to do? One, just go over that awareness. If um, that might be redundant to some of you, so you can, you know, have to now, but if it's not redundant, we're going to just, we're going to mention it because it's so key to what we do. Um, two is analyzing key areas of our syllabi that stood out to us. We're not going to talk about everything. So it's 
you are welcome to ask us questions. Um, three, hopefully we'll interact with some of these apps um, depending on our time and we'll interact with the, one another and um, go over some of the technology practices in a culturally relevant way. So how are we gonna do that? If we look at our agenda, um, one, we'll just address the CRSEs and some of uh, the policy. Um, the next talk part, part B, we'll talk about the revision process, uh, part C, the apps, and part D, look at some of the apps plus the assessment, because as you said, we have to have noted, we have to have that follow through, that line all the way across, and our sale by address that. So let's go down to our engagement and norms, and this is important. This was important because when we were a part of a group, the community is a practice group where about 20 institutions of higher education and teacher education got together and said, okay, we're going to work together to think about how we're going to revise our syllabi. We really need to be open. We need to be vulnerable because none of us have all the answers. Some have more than others, but we all enter at different places of this work and we need to honor each other's place of entering and to try to excavate understanding. So that means a safe place. And that means even for us, as we're asking questions here, it's a safe place to ask questions. And if for some reason you have a question, but you're like, hey, I don't want this recorded, just let us know. But as, as Luca also told us, um, and Luca Paxton, who's behind the scenes here helping us out, um, told us we can always edit it out. So don't feel like if you say something and you're like, I don't want that to get out there, please know we can, we can take it out. And the last place is growth. We know that our growth does happen when we enter that those uncomfortable areas. And so it's important that you even ask us questions sometimes that make us feel uncomfortable so that we can um, provide for you those pieces that, um, that are needed for you to help you understand and maybe help us to understand ourselves better. So before I move on a little bit, uh, Donna Marie, I don't know if we wanna share the Mentimeter and see if we have Anybody's comments about yeah. what you'd like to get One out? Second. Let's see. So, meanwhile, I have about 15 windows open, so bear with me. <laughs> She's all good stuff. All good stuff. Yeah, there. Um, I'll present my share my screen with you all and keep adding to the Mentimeter. I think we have about. I can't share, but I can. It says. Oh, not, I can. If I stop, that might help. Yep. Yeah, um, thank you, Carolyn. So this is just what you all have shared so far, but please go ahead and continue to contribute to that with the link that's provided for your reason for attending to be um, attending this session today. So intrigued by the description, you came also to hear about the range of work happening at ESU. Um, thank you for coming and excited to hear new strategies for incorporating CS CRSE into coursework. So if you haven't contributed to the Mentimeter, please continue to do so. Um, we definitely want to hear your reasons for being here. So as Beth said earlier, um, we can just continue to build on or support ideas that you have about why you're attending uh, the, these sessions. So thank you. Thanks, Donna Marie. Um, so we want to go into a moment, but a little bit about the why for the what, because we're going to go over the what a lot. All right, so the first thing we know that we as people, whoever we are, for whatever reason, we are built to relate to people who are have more in common with our experience. But we also know that students come from, um, or learn best from teachers actually, who appreciate their culture. We know that, that's documented. Um, and also many of us do not come from the same culture um, as our students. And so these CRCs are a way to help us think about and how to meet those students' needs and our needs too, so that we can learn and grow. So let's move on to the next slide. Excellent. Um, this is one that, that you probably know well, which talks about the disproportionality of students of color and teachers of color across the nation and in Pennsylvania. So the blue, um, even if you can just look at the colors, the blue is the percentage of the students of color and the orange is a percentage of teachers of color. And you see here um, that on the left-hand side is the United States and on the right-hand side is Pennsylvania. So you notice the disparity in Pennsylvania is much greater and that the, even though we have less students of color per se compared to the rest of the nation, that we only have 6.2 or 6.7, depending on you know where the data is now, um, teachers of color, but we have over 30% students of color. So this, this is just that one piece of data. It talks about the mismatch, but if we think of the 
the range of differences, it, you can imagine it's even greater. So if you scroll down. So we know that Pennsylvania um, put into place chapter 49, that we need to address culturally relevant competencies. Um, and that came out April 23rd, uh, 2022. And on the next page, um, we have the culturally relevant competencies. And if you haven't seen them before, if you just click on that link, Caroline, it will bring you to the competencies and you can find them simply by Googling as well. And uh, if you put you know, in Google, if you just do a search and say PA culturally relevant competencies, they will come up. So if we go back to the presentation, you'll see that there are nine competencies, but underneath each of those competencies are, are indicators that really help you to go deep um, in these various areas. So we're not gonna, going to address all nine areas. However, you are more than welcome. You are more than welcome to ask questions <laughs> about any of them. Um, and we can, we can talk about where we are in that process of integration. Um, so the first one really is reflecting on one's own cultural lens. So you're going to see that one a lot in uh, the work that we talk about. Another one that we hit on, um, I believe is provide all learners with equitable and differentiated opportunities to learn and succeed um, that you're going to see, especially even when we talk about assessments. And uh, da, 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 da. let me see, Promos promoting asset-based perspectives of difference is another one that we, we definitely um, lean into quite a bit. But like I said, you're more than welcome to ask about any of this with us. So if we move on to the next slide, we're gonna take a pause, um, just went over a bunch of information. Anything that stands out to you or something that you think is important that we haven't addressed? Because there's so much to this work. Um, one of the things that um, Donna Marie brought out in, is when uh, a piece of data from the Research for Action uh, group, they have done so much research that is beneficial. So if you haven't gone to Research for Action to look up the educational opportunity um, that is available for our students, um, please make sure that you do that because that it's a wonderful resource. But in this dashboard, which I have not had the time to take a look at, and I'd heard about yesterday, and I'll put the link on the side, Research for Action Education Opportunity Dashboard. Apparently, Pennsylvania came out 50th um, among the 50 states for its opportunity gap for our, I don't know if it was um, BIPOC students or students specifically who are Black. Um, but I don't know if anybody has knowledge of that and would like to speak directly to that. A comment in the chat. Yes, so definitely take a look at that, um, that data. Yeah. Very surprising. And even if you go to the Research for Action website and go into their search engine there's, or in their search, it's very helpful if you want to just learn about the teachers of color in Pennsylvania, the students of the BIPOC students in Pennsylvania, any disparities, even the disparity among um, and the disproportionality uh, for um, expulsion in preschool, believe it or not. I mean, so <laughs> there's this whole range and you're going, huh, and it, you'll, you'll come away scratching your head. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if we're talking about our education courses. It's also a great place to get data to bring into your classes and then have your students really think about it and go, what does this data show? What kind of questions does it raise in your mind? And why does it raise those questions? So um, I know that we're talking about syllabi, right? You know, more in here and not those specific activities, but that's it. That's it. The data is a great place to begin with your um, teacher education students. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to turn over to Caroline to talk about uh, syllabi a little bit and what they mean to us. Okay, great. So 
just kind of beginning this conversation as part of our um, participation in the community of practice, we all, all of the members from all the different institutions uh, engaged in um, reviewing our syllabi and looking for ways to improve, to include the competencies, but then also just thinking about what is a syllabus, right? And, and why is it so important? So there's some of the things that, that are given, right? It's an outline of the information for the course and really does act as a contract between the faculty member um, and the student. And I think that's how, I know traditionally, this is how I've always approached it and how I was taught to approach it. Um, it's also a document that communicates with students, um, providing our course objectives, assessments and expectations. And all of those things are very important. However, we really dove a little bit deeper to see, well, what more can a syllabus be? How can it help us um, create a more inclusionary and welcoming environment in our class? And because it is you know, that important document. So it could be a conversation between the student and the instructor. Um, in a little bit, we'll talk about some of the things with our own syllabi that stood out to us. Um, and this was something that resonated very much with me. Uh, bringing it more of a conversation than this contract where I have to be very, um, you know, specific in my wording and, and um, you know, very, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure of the word, maybe strict rather than more flexible and having more of a conversation. Um, it is a vulnerable introduction to self in the course. So it, it's not that we have to be this separate person in our courses that don't have lives outside of who we are as faculty. It really can be an opportunity for us to introduce ourselves and our own backgrounds and what we're bringing um, and how that will interact with, with individuals um, taking the course. So it, it can be that as well. And I think sometimes we shy away from, from sharing those things, but you know why not? Um, I think that's an important piece as students can relate to us um, as well. And it's also an opportunity to invite students um, into the process and engage from day one of the journey and, and not just look at a course as, this is a requirement that I have to take for my program, but this is an opportunity for me to learn. And it's part of my journey toward becoming a teacher and um, something that I can look at as, as more of a process than just a requirement or a box to check off. So what we will do and, and what we did as we were, were preparing is we all had um, different syllabus elements that we thought about as we participated in the community of practice. Um, and this was a wonderful process that we went through. As part of this, we were led um, through different components of our syllabus. Let, let's look at the objective and, and then let's look at how that aligns with our assessments and the course activities and, and then looking at where do the um, culturally relevant and staining education competencies come into that? So it really was a wonderful opportunity. So I think um, as Beth mentioned earlier, we're, we're not gonna be able to talk about everything because I think for a lot of us, there were many things um, that we learned and that stood out, but we will focus on the things that kind of stood out to us the most as we have our conversation um, here. So we'll explain how we addressed the element um, to make our syllabi stronger and did more than just simply embed you know, the competency in there, how we really went through a, a process. Um, so as we talk, if you have a syllabus in mind that you may want to modify, um, think about that. I know immediately when I started with the community of practice and was learning, you know, this was what came to mind for me. I had a particular course that I knew I wanted to, to modify. And so as we went through, that's the one that I was thinking of. But all of you may have different courses that you feel would, you know, benefit. I mean, of course, all of our syllabi can be improved, but you have to start somewhere, right? So that one that you think would be the best starting place. And I know for me, it was the course that I know I'm going to teach every semester. I've been teaching it for a while, and I knew I was already doing a little bit with the competencies. So I figured that was a good starting place. So I'll begin with mine. Um, the competency that I targeted for this class, this class is a, a course in special education assessment. Um, that's my background. And, and within this course, they learn the referral to placement process. Um, they learn about creating different types of assessments. They learn about progress monitoring. Um, but the competency that I target was utilize differentiated methods of communication to articulate clear expectations aligned with the ability of each learner, which allows them to demonstrate knowledge through different modalities. So as I started to become more um, 
aware of and, and more involved with the competencies, I began to look at the tone of my syllabus. And this really was very glaring to me and humbling um, because as I was looking at the tone, the writing, the way it communicated to students, I realized that it, it could be changed. Um, a lot of times too, I will post my syllabus on my learning management system before we have the course, which you know I'm sure students appreciate, they see what's coming. Um, but one of the issues with this is that is what the students are seeing before they ever meet me. So this is my first point of contact with students. Um, and that tone is gonna already start to build the culture of my course and um, the, the climate of my course. And therefore I need to be really more aware of, of the tone that I'm using. Um, so in addition to building the competencies into the course, I revised and adjusted the wording of my syllabus to make it just more welcoming and inclusive. We have so many great examples from different people that we met. We would do breakout rooms in the community of practice. So I could talk with other faculty who had suggestions and then there were very, um, there are many examples that I could use, but I realized that, um, and I'll give you an example of what I had and how I altered it in a moment, but I realized that the overall tone was not what I wanted it to be. And it wasn't what I wanted to communicate with my students as to who I am as, as a faculty member. Um, so again, uh, the syllabus is that first point of contact with the instructor in many cases. That tone does impact the course. You may think of it as not important, but it really is. Um, and the idea is to reframe the syllabus as a tool for communication versus a to-do list. Like these are all the things you need to do. And that just fosters that idea of students crossing things off. Okay, I need to do this. I need to do that assignment. And then I'm going to get my grade and walk away rather than looking at the, the course as an opportunity for learning, building community and, and really growing. Um, it is also a way to establish that relationship with your students. Again, it starts there with the syllabus. Um, and it's that means of creating that course climate or that culture within your classroom, how students will perceive you, how approachable you'll be, how flexible they will, will see that. And I do think that that makes a huge difference in, in learning. So I just wanted to provide this one example um, that I, what I had and what I changed. So uh, the first one is about participation. That's a big deal. Attendance is really important um, in our college of education, but also in my course. So participation is a significant part of your grade. Students will lose points for repeatedly missing class and or coming late or leaving early. Students are expected to remain engaged in each session and can contribute to our discussions. So really, how does this come across as you're going to do this or you're going to lose points, right? It doesn't create that welcoming, inclusive culture that I want to create. So just these simple <clears throat> things, such as rephrasing, your input is valued and welcomed in this class. You all have unique backgrounds that enhance our class community and contribute to learning. You are encouraged to share your experiences. I will work to create an environment where you feel safe and open to do so if you wish. So also putting in there my um, putting a little bit on me too, is that I would like you to do this, but I'm also going to create a space where you will feel comfortable doing that. So just, you know, it's not a big deal, but it ends up being a big deal when you kind of see the glaring um, difference between these two statements. All right, Beth, you are up. Sorry, I was talking to myself. Um, thank you. <laughs> but thank you, Caroline. I think that it's so important. Um, and and I, I do, I love the work that we did and and really picking apart almost all the different things of your syllabus that you have and said, is this, does this invite somebody in or does it push them away, right? Just, it's a simple ask. Does it invite them in or push them away? Yeah, thank you. All right, so my, the one that I had to work on, I felt that was the most salient. Of course, we worked on so many different things. Um, but really, uh, it's competency three, um, and it's design and facilitate culturally relevant learning that brings in real, real world experience into educational spaces. Now, I taught a methods course for, and I teach, sorry, I don't taught, I currently do a methods course for secondary, secondary education. And we know, yeah, of course, we want to bring in real world experiences, right? That's that's what we want to do in our upper level education courses, even our lower level um, and everything that we do in education, because we want students to have that transfer of knowledge. But if we dig a little bit deeper into the indicators, it goes further. 3D, challenge their own beliefs, attitudes and assumptions and behaviors regarding the knowledge and backgrounds of the dominant and non-dominant social groups thinking critically about the nuances of culture. 
identity and their other social markers and how they manifest themselves in curricula and other educational materials. So um, if we were just to, to think about this, I, I know that many of us have gone there, but if we think about, okay, who are the authors that we study in English? English class, right? Who are the main authors? Who are the big physics names and science names that come to your mind? If I say science, who's a great scientist? Who's the first person that comes to your mind? How about mathematician? You know, and, and even if we were to Google images of these things, um, the algorithm behind those, you know, they're predominantly figures who identify phenotypically white. And so um, when we're thinking about methods, when we're thinking about course materials, how can we lean into that and have students do that questioning? And um, so my question was, how could I support that addressed the dominant culture and non-dominant social groups to support our thinking critically about materials and lesson plans. Like, how do I do that? How do I get that support? Um, and really in our group, we other people helped me. I mean, this is me be, being vulnerable. Um, and Amber, Dr. Amber Pablon, Pablon from um, Kutztown University said, let literature help with the heavy lift. So um, I found it quite different to uh, to find supportive readings that went beyond the theoretical. There are awesome, um, awesome, awesome, awesome um, literature out there for um, the theoretical portions, but not as many, or there weren't as many that really addressed the mechanics of teaching, right? The mechanics meaning the method. And so before I go on to the next slide, I would like to make a correction that I would like to thank George for. And that he says it's it take out the L in Amber Pabon. It's Pabon instead of Pablon. Um, no L in her name. I apologize, Amber. <laughs> um, so move on to the next one. I will definitely take that out and maybe send you a new one. How embarrassing, but you know, that's us as we grow. Um, so thank you. So um, I had some tension though with this, and this might sound odd, um, but you know, being a tech user and a strong believer in open education resources and open technology, um, I'm a big proponent of um, university of the people and that those kinds of works. Um, I had to really think about this because always in this course, since I took it over, I was using open educational resources. I was not having my students purchase a book. And so I had to think about this and what this meant. But I also thought, you know, it's, this is very important, number one. And number two, students are buying books all the time and they're usually buying them about authors, from authors who are white. So if I'm asking students to buy a book that comes from a perspective of a person who is black, um, and that is going to bring them into the culturally relevant and sustaining education competencies in such a way that they can digest it, it's worth the money. So I did. I looked for a book that was reasonable, um, that I also liked. I love. I enjoyed this book, Culturally Relevant and Responsive Teaching in the Brain, Promoting Authentic Engagement and Rigor Among Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students by um, uh, Zaretta Hammond. And so this is the book that I started with because this is the one that I knew also addressed um, the neuroscience a little bit and put it into very digestible terms and also uh, gave good strategies for the learning partnership that we want to occur and building that cultural humility and questioning ourselves. Um, so we're looking for those nuances um, in the way that we perceive something or the way that we rate something and then and into those materials. However, um, last year, and this is, I want to give a you know, shout out to Luca for um, turning me on to this. Goldie Muhammad wrote a book, Unearthing Joy. There's a book before this one. But in this one, um, she talks about the five pursuits. And so this is the book that I'm going to be moving to in this class um, next semester. But it's also very practical and talks about how it is we can address our content areas. And um, and in the content areas, bring out um, really uh, the five areas, which are identity, skills, intellect, criticality, joy, in helping us 
think about whatever lesson we're doing and teaching. So I'm really excited about this book as well. I'm sad to say goodbye to the other one, just so you know, but my stomach can't allow just two. And the students don't have time to read two because they're out in the field so much. Um, but we'll pull from resources from both of those for sure. So next slide, syllabus changes, let's see. What do we have? Okay, so another person who is a part of our group really looked into um, labor-based grading. And thanks, George, makes this good point. Um, you integrated the STEM and STEAM um, by Chris Edmond. Yes, absolutely. You know what? And if I taught science, I definitely would as well. And I love his book. Um, I love it. Yeah, it's a, it's a good read. Many of his books. Thank you. Um, so the the other person that apparently they couldn't be here is um Dr. Kiesbach, and she moves into labor based grading that really looked at the way that she assesses based on where students started and based on where they ended up. So that was the main point that she really integrated into her syllabus, and so I wanted to bring that out because. When we think of a syllabus, it's not just the information up front, but it's how we're assessing somebody in the end and determining what success is. So before we move into more discussions about that, I would like to go on to the inquiry question, the next one. What resonated with the syllabi revision, perhaps, or maybe any questions that you might have or um, anything that you wonder about? So let's we'll just take a moment and you can put any of your thoughts in the chat or you're welcome to also um, just verbally speak out. Okay. Well, I think both Carolyn and I um, you know, went through our objectives, you know, thinking about um, thinking about the objectives of the course and where we could integrate each of the CRSEs and how they would make each a little bit more robust uh, mm -hmm. so that it wasn't just in one element, but throughout the entire thing. Caroline, is there anything else that you would like to say as we close up the syllabi aspect and move into the um, some other parts? I think for me, it was the systematic process that we followed was really helpful because sometimes when, you know, when we're trying to do some of this work, it's just, okay, let's throw this here and this and there. And this mm -hmm. forced me to be systematic, which I may not have done otherwise. So I really appreciated the ability to kind of go piece by piece and make sure everything lined up and to see what I'm doing and how that could be better. Absolutely. And I don't know if you can hear, uh, the 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 banging behind me but they're building can you hear it <laughs> have it too <laughs> okay <New> building coming <laughs> we're putting up a new university center okay excellent yeah oh thank you some um had the idea of looking at uh batan to see from other some other resources that's a great idea thank you yeah all right, so um, just the next part, before we go into the app review, I do, do is the repository link there? It is. Okay, uh, is it, okay. just so you all know that there's links to the webinars, we don't have to go there, but um, if you want to look at the CRSE repository, I know that we're having some tech issues at the moment because that's what technology does. It's wonderful when it works, um, but that is where you can find all of the different items um, or actually people who also reviewed their syllabi and different programs and things like that. So you can look over their work and see how they went about it. Okay, thanks. All right. All right. So next we're just gonna move into some te technology. Um, we'd like to remind you that with technology, apps are inherently nothing. Technology is nothing, but you are the window into how the app is used. So I would say that if you look at apps, one of the commonalities that we have all had is we use CRSE number five, which is really promoting an asset-based perspective about difference. Rather than looking at a student's point of view and disregarding it, but it's like, how are they entering into this work? And then whatever the work is, and then 
how are they working on it and growing through it? Uh, and then how can we scaffold them? So Caroline, I want to turn it to you to talk about Mentimeter. Okay. All right, so Mentimeter is a tool um, that I use quite a bit. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and I know uh, Donna Marie uses it as well. And we have some examples um, from Donna Marie later too. Um, but the, just it has so many things that it can do that makes it very useful. So this first slide just kind of gives an overview of, of what it can do. And I know you've all used it just a minute ago and maybe you use it um, in the work that you do, but you know, everything from word clouds, quizzes, open-ended questions. It's great for icebreakers, like quick assessments. So it's one that I really um, enjoy using and I, I usually have, have pretty good success with it. Um, so I use Mentimeter to address competency 4A, make fair and equitable instructional and assessment decisions to ensure all learners have equitable access to educational resources, experiences, and opportunities. And this was actually twofold or dual purpose. So it helped me introduce an activity about bias in the standardized assessment. Um, we talk in, in my course about the placement um, or the re referral to placement process. And so I'm trying to make the point about how our bias, our assessment um, is sometimes biased and, and many times biased in that process and what that means as we're identifying students for special education services. But um, I kind of began at the very beginning and I just asked students to first identify their favorite way to show what they know and then rank order different types of assessments. So as they responded in real time, the posts would appear and it sparked a great discussion about how we all have different ways of demonstrating our learning based on our strengths and weaknesses, leading to a discussion about how assessment practices that are biased are not a true uh, picture of one's abilities. It's just simply, you know, they could be very good at something, but if the, the content isn't appropriate to their background or they don't have the background in that particular construct that the, the question is built around, they're not going to do as well, which is is unfair, um, and then can lead to decisions about placement that are um, inaccurate and have long long uh, consequences. So these are just some of the students' um, uh, responses, and um, you know we have education majors, so they oftentimes like projects and essays. This next slide actually shows um, the poll we did. So projects came out first with standardized assessments as the fourth, but again, just that conversation that this was able to spark and, and it didn't take long, but it, it really made a good point as we were entering into that discussion of why it's important to use a variety of assessments and do our best to make sure that we are um, ensuring that they are not biased. Um, in a second example, I use this in another course that I teach on positive behavior support. And one of the things that we do in the beginning of the course is we talk about quality of life and how that for many of our students impacts classroom behavior. Um, so again, I took it back to the, the beginning. I actually leaned on um, standard or competency 1A where you reflect on your own life experiences um, and membership to various identity groups. And I just asked students to kind of reflect on themselves. So as we're considering quality of life for others, it's important to think of, okay, well, what makes life worth living for me? And that was the question that I asked them. A, to make it um, important for them to see how these things relate to quality of life. And then B, to kind of see that there are some things that are universals, um, health and safety, but other things are very individual friends, hobbies, different hobbies, different families, many people had pets, some didn't. So not everything that we use to look at quality of life um, is related back to what we like. So it allows us to kind of consider the differences of one another. And then we just did a kind of fun word cloud. This is just another fun thing you can do with Mentimeter where students talked about the, their one word, if they could just describe in one word how they would like to be treated. And again, getting them to think about their students eventually and, and how they will um, treat them. So this first one um, gives you an example of how students responded. And you could see some things were familiar. Um, a lot of people mentioned family in this one, but then there were just some different things that um, students had on there. So that was great. And then this was the wordle that it generated. And um, you know, the, the word that's the largest is the one that came up the most and that was respected. So that then, you know, became a part of our, our class. This was a nice assessment for me to see what matters um, to the students that I had, but also for them to start to think about the learners that they will be working with um, as teachers. And these are Donna Marie's. Donna Marie, are you? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, thanks. 
So I'm with Caroline 100% on this. I um, My reason for using Mentimeter in class is I, I teach two really large classes and I never really get to hear the voices of all of my students and I never really fully get to understand how they are um, engaging with materials like on a on a day-to-day -day basis when we have classes. So, um, and oftentimes they're really quiet. I mean, A, it's the, the setup of the class and you know the fact that we can't always hear each other. And so in order for me to kind of gauge um, how they're understanding the materials, in addition to, of course, using other technology, like through um, our D2L system, if you're familiar with that, I have them use the discussion board to kind of engage with each other. And then in class, I'll use Mentimeter to ask questions about the reading. And so um, one article that we focused on in their text was, um, you know, just what is socially just teaching, which was a section of the book that they read. And then they kind of shared out with me and it gives me an opportunity to kind of follow up with them and to kind of build on discussions in class to um, engage them and even other people in unpacking some of these ideas. And I think what Mentimeter has done uh, when I use it in these kind of settings is to help me to kind of build up and enrich the discussion in my class. Whereas if I weren't using it, students would be really silent, disengaged, and I wouldn't have an opportunity to kind of see and understand um, kind of what they're getting out of the materials that, that I'm using. So that's really the purpose. And as you can see, I have 39 responses here for this particular Mentimeter in a class of sometimes 45 students, um, sometimes 60 students, which is pretty um, significant engagement from students in the class. Sometimes I have 55 responses, right, depending on. So I know that it's a tool that students really appreciate. And they also do presentations in class. And I find that they use Mentimeter as well. <laughs> so um, they also think it's useful. So um, it's something that we engage with often. So, yep. Beth. Sure. And you know what? I'll screen share, Caroline, just so that we can, um, I can show very quickly these elements. Um, so what Carolyn had up there was the interactive notebooks. And I use interactive notebooks, not tons, but just for very specific things where I want comprehension of information. But I, I create them, right? Because I want to have control somewhat of the student resources, especially if I'm, well, before I was doing everything, um, with open educational resources, right? So I had to pick them. Um, now I have a good book, so it makes it a little bit easier. But you know, here's one interactive notebook um, that was used for my methods course, and you know, as a result, they could they could do things. So it's not just you know paper, pencil, or not just writing. You know, writing linear because we always have to remember that writing is is made for the linear learner, right? It's all the way across. But with they can interact with the different elements and move them around like they're supposed to. Um, you know, to mean different things, to write in different areas, but also to use different resources and resources that a book wouldn't have access to necessarily. And it's only one way of knowing. So and here they can have their voice and their interaction with that content. Um, think about where something belongs to make it interactive. And it's not hard to make interactive notebooks. And it also models for them um, a pedagogy that they can use in their K-12 schools, which is really important when doing when working with teachers is to model not only um, in, in our words, but also with our tools. And so that's what important for one of the courses that I teach. And then here, this is just a doctoral level one too, believe it or not. Yes, I had a doctoral level interactive notebook, um, but this is, they were looking at ontology and, and epistemology. Um, and so in here, so it's, what is your truth? And, you know, they could go through this and, and talk about these different elements of what their truth was and, and what their content was. And once again, I could pick out the articles for them um, to read so that they could then look at them, but not look at them in a, in a dull and boring way and just, and just interact with them in such a way that they could be accessible to them and a little bit fun um, and also feel like they have authority behind the subject and they can, and their opinions are once again valued. So leaning into that, you know, the um, believing and doing and acting and evaluating them in such a way that aligns with the competencies. So Carolyn, I'm going to turn back over to you to uh, move into the next part of our presentation. There we go.
So what tools, any, anybody else use any other tools that, um, that you find are really helpful? There is a question in here. Um, George asked, do you have any templates for interactive notebooks that you could share? I'm happy to share the ones that I have, but honestly, if you go to um, Slide Carnival and all that kind of thing and just put in interactive notebooks, you're going to find tons. And if you teach science, there are some awesome ones out there. Um, and then it's really cool because it's you can find those interactive articles that talk about equity in science um, and uh, disproportionality of different areas. And, and I think that's really helpful. Yeah, but I can put those links in there too. Just know that uh they're always being revised like the one i found the link was down the other day i was like no no so michelle mentions ed puzzle yeah. and the padlet and jam board right which is supposed to be i think fig jam right it's morphing into fig jam what i heard oh is it oh yeah. fig jam? is that what it's going to become okay yeah, yeah okay. both of those and i think you know we're all educators here which is it just phenomenal um but we, we also, I think, have a tendency really on our different people's perspective that if students are going into a world where they're teaching about their content and there's a lot of right and wrong, and I'm going to lean into math, right? Math, there's right and wrong answers. And how do we accept where students are coming from and also guide them and scaffold them to get that computation so they get that end answer result? So if ways that we can model that are phenomenal. Yeah. Okay, so assessment, and I'm gonna get those links in there in a moment. So assessment, if we look at that, um, assessment really leans into competency four. I feel like uh, it does. Um, providing all learners with equitable and differentiated approaches, uh, opportunities to learn and succeed. And I would say all of the indicators there address that. And of course, the first questions that you asked Caroline also did, right, with your students in your um, in your uh, Mentimeter. And so uh, those of you who come from a special education background or technology, um, if you go to the next slide, we, we talk about um, UDL as really a way to, to harness that so that multiple means of action expression, which is actually at the bottom. But we also have the process, the process or assessment for learning. Um, and we have the content. So when we think about assessment, we have kind of three components here that can help us think about how to go. So um, underneath the assessment for learning, one of the things that has been used is competency-based grading. So we'll look at that briefly, how I do that. Um, and multiple means of action expression, we'll have some examples of that for end products that use technology. So if you can go to the next one. All right, so in here, here's an example. I just did like cutouts here so you can see them for how I do this a little bit. Um, this is a little sample of how I do competency-based grading when it's not a competency-based grading course. Um, and that is that students are allowed to do revisions on their product. So you'll see, you'll see there's a feedback one because that was feedback that was given based on the first submission. Um, they then have to determine how they're going to revise something based on the comments back to them, which are, you know, actionable and and hopefully things that they can also think about and ponder. And then they get feedback, too, um, because it might still might not meet the need. And I've had just so you know, I've had students submit up to seven times and actually even students that became fine teachers. So I know that, you know, there's that um, boundary that teachers have or instructors have to wrestle with, which is, you know, I want to teach them responsibility and timeliness, which is so important in our world. Right. And we only have so much time. So, of course, each instructor has to weigh that. Um, but then there's also the fact that growth is not linear, right? So at what point as an instructor do you want to model um, how growth occurs so that those students can then honor that and model that in their own classroom? And I always think, you know, when I go to a ski slope, but I go to Camelback because I go skiing. I don't go to Camelback much, but anymore. Um, but you can see people on the ski slope that are 70 years old learning how to ski. And we don't berate them, we celebrate them, right? We celebrate the fact that they're still pushing themselves. Um, and yet many times in learning, we don't do that. So if we go to the next slide, I think here we have some examples of multiple means of representation. And this is uh, Donna Marie and some of her assignments. 
Yeah, um, thanks, Beth. So I will kind of talk through what, and I think the competency that Beth showed earlier really speaks to um, these activities that I've had my students engage in, both at the um, you know undergraduate level, um, master's level. And I think what, what's important for me is giving them the opportunity. I know we all have different ways of engaging with students around like grading and assessments, but really giving them the opportunity to choose the way they think they can best demonstrate their learning um, and then I have to ask myself questions about like, what do I want to know or what do I want to understand about how they, what they've taken away from um, what I've been teaching. And so this um, particular activity here um, was for one of um, my classes. Uh, it was a classroom diversity course and students worked together collaboratively to really focus on a particular um, text that they read together and really they created a podcast so what you're looking at here with, that you can't hear, <laughs> of course you're looking at, is just like page one of what's included in their um, in their PDF that they shared, but also it's a companion to that podcast, right? So um, they're talking about these themes of the resistance of oppression, um, resist uh, respecting diversity in their classrooms. And in addition to that, they even went beyond the books that I assigned and found other texts that they wanted to use and so that's where you see Sister Outsider being a central part of what they what they presented on. And what they did in this particular activity was talk through, talk through how they understood the text, engage in a conversation with each other around the central themes of the um, of the text and their takeaways and the application to their teaching. So that's one way they they um, demonstrated their learning. Another way could be just writing a paper. Um, I'm not sure if you can, uh, the abolitionist podcast. Are you able to share that, Beth? Let's hear what that sounds like. I was, yeah, let me see if I can get it up. I was able to earlier because I clicked on it. Go ahead and click on it right there. Should I click on it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and if I can find it. you know what, Carolyn, could you stop sharing and then try to share again, but click on sound because I think we're not getting the sound. Totally. Oh, from I can... share oh, you could. your sound? Yeah, if you unshare, and then share again, like unshare it, just, there we go. So. And then go to share again, but don't click it right away and click uh, sound. Okay. Before you do that in the bottom left-hand side, then okay. it should pick it up nicely. Just bear with me for a moment. <laughs> and I can, let me see if I can pull it up too. I can always. Because I think it is worth hearing. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So. Yeah, I think if it's even the first couple yeah. um, minutes, it would be would be good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Should I be able to? I, I, yeah. I think I might need to. Um, you want me to do it? Maybe. <laughs> okay. No. No problem. It's. Should I try it one more time? Oh yeah, try it one more Let time. Know if it works. Yep. Shut up. Is it coming through? It's not coming through us. Oh no. I also have it here. So if you want to just stop, I can play it. That sounds good. Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, why don't you do that, Donna Marie? Yeah. Because you, it's your fault. Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. I'm going to, I'll share my screen for the sake of sharing it, but there's nothing to look at. So just give me a second. I'm just playing it from, um, what do you call this? iTunes. As you can see, my iTunes is seriously out of date. <laughs> Are you a can you hear that? Are you a fighter or were you a coward? It's our time yeah. to tip back the power. Once Hello, and welcome to the Abolitionist Hour. This podcast was created 
by three white female teachers from Eastern Pennsylvania as part of a diversity, equity, and inclusion graduate cohort through East Stroudsburg University. On our journey to become anti-racists, we discussed the abolitionist teaching ideas explored by Bell Hooks in her groundbreaking book, Teaching to Transgress. We will discuss Hooks' idea of liberational teaching and using education as a practice of freedom. Each episode focuses on a specific challenge of teachers seeking to disrupt the current racist patriarchal pedagogy that dominates the USA's education system. In our first episode, we explore uncovering our implicit biases and shifting the conversations in classrooms from intent to impact. Our second episode focuses on embracing AI technology as a tool to provide equity and inclusion in education and incorporating Hooke's thinking around the concept of literacy and consciousness. Lastly, in our third episode, we explore the intersectionality of identity and how to give students a voice through restorative practices, which connects Hooke's notion that education should be progressive and holistic, ultimately grappling with how all of this impacts our teaching praxis, another major theme of Hooke's work. We welcome you on our journey to be not only anti-racist, but also abolitionist teachers. Hi, welcome to the Abolitionist Hour. I'm Lynn Vento, and I'm here with... Lauren Arico And Gillian Turner. Okay, so we are basing our podcast on uh, readings that we did for our class, and the, the book that we focused on was Teaching to Durangra. Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. Um, episode one, we are focusing on implicit bias. And one of the things that was really fascinating for me in Bell Hooks's book was her talking about the holistic model of how uh, learning takes place with students and teachers, and that we grow together and we be empowered um, by each other in the learning process. But that requires teachers to be vulnerable and genuine. The other thing that really uh, resonated with me was her focus on building community and keeping intellectual rigor, but also making sure that every student was seen, that every student was visible and participating in the classroom. And in order to do that, uh, the teacher really needs to recognize their own biases. And so I took that personally and wanted to know, do I show up in my classroom with bias? So using a survey that I found um, online, and I basically came up with, I don't know, what was there, like 35 questions, something like that. Um, I asked my students, I focused on three different topics. I focused on their, um, ethnicity or, or race identity. I focused on their gender identity and I focused on their language skills. And I picked language skills as my third characteristic because I would say about 70% of my student body has um, Hispanic background. And I have about 15% of my students in my classroom where English is not their primary language. So I wanted to know if, if I had biases that way. Um, you guys also gave the survey to your students. What did you think? I actually became intrigued uh, when I heard you talking about it. I, I thought, wow, I, I've never really taken it to that level before. So uh, first I asked you, I remember, can you share that with me? And So I could, I mean, if you want to listen to the whole podcast, I will share it with you. Um, I think I just want to share like two other things, right? So that's at the graduate level. And um, what I appreciated about that assessment, right? It's that they could have written a paper together collaboratively, which another one of my classes are doing this semester, which is fine. But I, I, I really, really appreciated how they grappled with the ideas that came out of those books. And that's really more important to me than them just being able to put down on paper that this resonated or this was important. And I think too, in the age of AI, where they can just ask AI to write them a final paper, this is something that really will allow your students to, to, ex to examine like 
what are these ideas? And the fact that they took up not just the ideas, but put it into sort of some kind of application, right? Am I biased? How do I know? Creating their own survey around what that could look like for them, to me, just really demonstrated the level of understanding that they had around what I was trying to get across to them. And they fully engage with the competencies. Now, at the undergraduate level, and I just want to share this, that they read different books. The books were not as intense as the ones that I had the graduate students read. So I had what I had them do, and this is for a project, it's a choice read. So in the past, and I'm 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 newer than um, some of my other colleagues, right? So I'm still learning and engaging with syllabi that was designed not by me, but really just working within those structures and thinking about, oh, we had a choice read activity that they used to do. How could I change up the chat the titles of those books to give them something else to examine? The initial activity that they had for this assignment was essentially do the choice read, and I think they had to like write a a paper. Ooh. I, I didn't see anything really significant come out of that. I still allow them to do that. I still allowed students. I gave them the option. You can still write your paper about your choice read as an independent activity, or you can do a one pager. Dr. Um, Laura Kisselbach is not here. And I got this idea from partly an activity that I used to do formally um, in my teaching, but just really thinking about how could we get like visual representations of like what it is that they're reading and take quotations from the text the last time I did this, and this is really, this speaks to growth on, on my part, learning that I take away from previous courses on that sort of continuum of growth for me and continuum of growth for my students, right? It's I had them do the one pager, but I was frustrated that I didn't know what, are the, what sense are they making of these things that they've put on this paper, right? I'm not fully understanding. So this time around, I just asked them to talk to me about that one pager in a put together a video explain to me what it is that you've selected your whys. So I'm going to share with you. And That's remember that while yeah. you're sharing, do you think, thank you so much for sharing those examples and also yeah. the struggle between that. While you're getting that up to share, could we um, cut over to um, Luca? So Luca can uh, bring us to what the, they need to do their feedback form. Because yeah. he reminded me it's 104. How much more time do we have? I'll just take two minutes of your time. We have <laughs> negative five minutes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, if, so if, I'll- Can, can yeah. I give the feedback form just in case folks have to go and then you can have your time after? Perfect. Because um, if people are able to stay, then I really would hope that they do because the, the stuff that you have to share is awesome. But if you do have to go, Thanks. we ask that you please fill out that feedback form that I just put in the chat. All of the questions are optional. Um, but if you- are able to do that, it's also a chance to get connected with any of our presenters today for coaching or thought partnership support that they're able to provide as part of their participation in the community of practice. So if you are interested in learning or speaking more with them, please fill out that form so we can connect you. All right, Thank go you. for it. Thank you, Luca. So anyway, I'll share this with you really briefly. And what I really appreciated, I think at the undergraduate level more than anything else is that they're really new to this. They're entering the conversation and some of these are students who don't barely raise their hands in class and they are just really thinking about these ideas. And so I'll share just this one. I, I mean, I have like 10 of them pulled up because I was fascinating just in listening to them unpack these ideas. So I'll just share one with you um, so you can get a good idea of like just what we mean by really differentiated opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning. So give me a second, I'm gonna... So what you're looking at is the, the one pager essentially, right? So these, they read, this particular student read to teach the journey of a teacher by Bill Ayers. And um, what this student did was kind of selected the different parts that of course bring in visuals and different parts of the text that had meaning for them. So I'm just gonna press play. I'll play, play like a minute of it. So you can just kind of hear them unpacking just the ideas that emerge out of that book. My one pager is on the book To Teach by William Ayers by Kay Christopher. Starting off with quotations, the three that I picked, starting with teachers must be experts and generalists, psychologists and cops, rabbis and priests, judges and gurus, and that's not all. Another one I picked is you know more about your child than I can ever hope to know. 
What advice can you give me to make a better teacher for her? The last quote I picked. Teaching, if it is to be done well, must be built on vision and commitment. Learning, if it is to be meaningful, depends on imagination and risk-taking and intention and invention. I picked these quotes because they stood out to me and what it means to be a real teacher and a good one at that. All of these quotes put into perspective what it's like to be a good teacher and how to do things right. Out the main character, which I chose the author, William Ayers. He is a very smart man as he has got his doctorates and he was a professor for a very long time and also graduated from the prestige University of Columbia. He strives for success when teaching. He likes to complete his goals. He's a political member and he's a very good writer as we can tell by reading this book. He also has wrote many other books. Next, we're gonna talk about his writing style when writing the book to teach. William Ayers used a very leftism style of writing. He developed ideas in response to the more traditionally statist policies of their generation. So I'm gonna stop and I and I wanna share, I would love to share with you more of the ways in which they unpack the text. And I gave them the freedom to just think about what they appreciated about the authors and I see where um, what they appreciated about the author in terms of how they wrote the book, about the approach that they took in the text, about um, what resonated with them. And I think what's, imp what's important to me and what I understood from them is they're still learning. Mm -hmm. They're still unpacking. It's very different than the podcast that we looked at earlier. Um, and for me, it's just one way for them mid-semester to demonstrate how they're understanding and grappling with concepts and ideas that are really challenging for them. So what you hear from them across the board, and, and this is just different students, how they how they talk about the work, how they take up the work, um, just looks very different. And I have like 15, 20 of them I could share with you all. Um, I think, let me just show one more and then I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm just gonna stop. Just one more screen share. Um, just a student, just um, for her, just kind of all right, so one. the book that I did this was for white Crimson's folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too, yeah. by Christopher Emden. Yeah, uh, that is two pictures on the left is just the cover and a picture of the author himself. Mm -hmm. And what I think, before diving into anything specific in this book, is I think it's important to note out that it was written by, you know, an African American because he's it's the book's all about you know white teachers who are struggling to fit in to maybe certain areas that they're not uh used to and they so and i'm gonna stop sharing because i think i can share these with you anyway at another time but i just want to highlight that these are uh, many of them are white students that are taking up these ideas for the first time so they might seem very much like uncertain or still grappling with ideas, but that's the whole idea, right? For them to talk it through with themselves um, and to ask questions and to think about like what these ideas mean. Um, and we just kind of engage and it's not a high stakes assessment. It's the mid semester. Um, it's a book that they selected. They had many choices. These are the ones that they kind of, can, that they decided on. And those who didn't do this one pager wrote a paper, mm -hmm. right? So that's one way in which they wanted to demonstrate their learning and their takeaways from the text. And over and over again, we try to just give and offer opportunities. I think to, to Beth's point, asking my students also in SEM2, well, in uh, another course that I teach, it's like, well, what are the different opportunities you're giving your students in order to demonstrate their learning and understanding or takeaways from what it is that you're doing? So not just like modeling it for the classes that I'm teaching, but also asking my students to model that and demonstrate that to me for the students that they're teaching as well. I'll stop there. I know we're over time. <laughs> Great.
it's wonderful to feel the enthusiasm and how, how important it is to carry um, all the work that we do from the very beginning as you started with your syllabus and the tone, Carolyn, to the very end when that is assessment and where we want them to end up. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Luca, for- Thank running. you. Thank you. I'm going to-